today, it would be two weeks before I could get around to worrying about it. Now, that's what we would expect from people of the world who do not know the Lord. They do not know about his grace, his mercy, his goodness, and that he keeps all his promises. But that should not be the case, Jesus teaches us, for one of his disciples, for one who is a true servant of the Lord. And here in Matthew chapter 6, our Lord and Savior gives the most complete treatise on this subject uh, in all the Bible. Three times in Matthew chapter 6, if you want to reference it while I highlight it here, Matthew 6, verse 25, he'll say something similar, do not worry or do not be anxious. Our Lord does not want us to be anxious people. He says, don't, don't be anxious about your life food, clothing, even the basic things. Verse 31, he says, don't be anxious for food or clothing. You know, often many of our anxieties are over luxuries, not fundamental things like this. But Jesus is saying, don't even be torn about fundamental things. And then verse 34, he says, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. The word anxiety. Some translations have worry and some have anxiety. So we'll translate or uh, define both. Anxiety means to be torn. It means to be divided. Um, it's a person who's conflicted. Okay. He's conflicted between trust and hope on one side and lack of trust, doubt, unbelief on the other side. He's constantly torn between the two. That's the idea of anxiety. You're, you're torn. You know, should I stand here and just know that, you know, I'm going to be fine. I, I'm in the Lord. I'm rejoicing in the Lord no matter what. I know the Lord will take care of me. And I have a home in heaven with him someday as I trust in him. Or do I have doubts about this or that? Uh, usually things, physical things in this life as to whether or not God is taking care of you. And a disciple of Jesus Christ should not be conflicted in that way, Jesus says. The term worry is an old German term, uh, and uh, it means to strangle. To strangle. And that's certainly the idea in Matthew 13. Look over there for just a moment. Matthew 13. And uh, in the parable of the sower, the thorny soil, in verse 22, this is Jesus' interpretation of that particular soil. He said, and the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And so Jesus said the thorny soil represents a life that is suffocated, if you will, suffocated by temporal concerns about carnal things so much that his faith never comes to fruition. And so here you are, and you're sowing the seed of God's word, and you're trying to lead this precious soul to the Lord. And Satan, of course, is working against that process. And, you know, so you've, you've had the open door provided. God opened that door, and you're sowing the seed. But Satan's not going to give up because the open, open door is provided. He's going to use whatever means he has to stop that, and one of the things, one of the tools in his arsenal, and it's a common tool, is anxiety, worry. Worry over this and worry over that stops the process. And it suffocates the whole process so that it never comes to fruition. Uh, so we certainly need to be praying about that, need to be very aware of that in our efforts uh, to save the lost. 
Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, here in verse 19 through 34, Jesus gives what I count are seven reasons, at least seven reasons, as to why we should not worry, any one of which should be sufficient reason to not have anxiety. The first one's in verse 19, chapter 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And so the first reason given by Jesus to not worry is it is foolish. It is foolish to treasure the things of this world over heavenly things. Heavenly things are moth-proof, rust-proof, theft-proof. They're eternal in nature. And so we need to treasure heavenly things over the things of this world. The second reason he gives not to worry is it is a symptom that we are serving the wrong master. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon's uh, an Aramaic word meaning physical things, riches, wealth. Now, Jesus doesn't say we should not or we must not do this. He says you cannot serve God and wealth or carnal things. You can't do it any more than something can be hot and cold at the same time. Or you can go in two different directions at the same time. He said you cannot do this. We cannot serve God and mammon. Third reason he gives to not worry as we noted last week, was, uh, is here in verse 25. He says, for this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body than clothing? And so Jesus argues here from the greater to the lesser. Of course, life is more than food and clothing and houses and furnishings and automobiles and recreation, even jobs. Colossians 3, 4, Paul said, Christ is our life. Christ is our life. And uh, our greatest desire is pleasing the Lord. So argument from greater to lesser, life is more than these things. Life is Christ. The fourth reason to not worry. Verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? God takes care of the birds abundantly. He'll certainly take care of his children. Lesser to greater. Fifth reason, read verse 27. What is the reason there to not worry? Yeah, we think we're in control, to your point, you know, last week. We think we're in control, but there's so many things we have no control over. We can't change. And uh, Jesus gives the example of your stature or your life. You know, you can't add a day by worry. You might take some time off, you know, from your life because stress is very harmful physically, mentally, as well as spiritually. Um, so it's foolish. It's futile. It is an absolute waste of time. And if you draw other people into your worrisome situation, you're wasting their time as well. You, want, you need to talk about something, then fine. And uh, something where someone can help you do something constructive, certainly prayer. But uh, just to worry about something is, is futile. Uh, number six, what is the argument there? Read, if you will, just verse 30. What's the argument in verse 30? Sixth reason to not have anxiety given by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He clearly does not want us to do this. 
Again, an argument from lesser to greater. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which he does beautifully, then he will also clothe us. He'll provide our clothing, all the things that we need. And then uh, what is the seventh reason? Read verse 31 and 32. Do not be anxious then saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we clothe ourselves with? All these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. Your heavenly father knows you need all these things. So worry is characteristic of who? Those who don't know God. They don't know God. So we can understand why they may be in that situation. But if you know the Lord, how merciful and gracious and good he is, keeping his promises, then we should not worry. Now, on the positive side, verse 33, this is where we got to last week in our study. Jesus says this, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Now, these things in the context are what? These things. Microwaves, uh, making sure your ice maker works on the refrigerator, right? That's a big deal. Getting gas for that mower, two cycle, four cycle, one, 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 here, you know. What are the things in this context? Food and clothing. You know, sometimes we, you know, I, you just want to, you hear some of the worries and anxieties people have, and you want to say, get real. Get real. Really? You're, you're concerned about this little, you know, whether or not paint is this color or that color in a room? You know, do I want carpeting or hardwood? And, you know, we need to get real here. Jesus is talking about the basic things, food and clothing, shelter. He says, uh, you know, we, we should not be anxious even over these things. Uh, but what we need to be doing is, and, and the Greek here is present, is what's called present indicative, ongoing, continual seeking first. So the kingdom began about two years after Jesus' teaching here. The kingdom promised by Daniel and Isaiah and Micah and all the prophets, it was established. It was established. And now Jesus says, you need to keep putting it first. So you're part of that kingdom. You're in that kingdom. Keep it first. That's a continual thing. Make sure it's first. And so... The kingdom of God is not to be competing for a place. It is first place all the time and the righteousness of that kingdom. And so keep that first always in uh, your heart. Yes, brother. I thought in this first document, the word anxious or worry is the first verse 20. And I think your definitions at the beginning explain why, because it's not the Bible, it's single Bible. The kingdom is the only thing that I'm even thinking about. Yeah. And it's not worry, it's not strangulation. That's actually yeah. why. Mm -hmm. When I'm thinking of God's kingdom, I'm bringing life into my body, mm -hmm. not strangling life out of my body. Amen. Yeah, it, yeah. And to, to that point, we'll use again the illustration that. You know, the kingdom of Jesus Christ is to be first. And so, that being the case, um, the righteousness of that kingdom, which is through Jesus Christ, that, what will that determine? What will putting the kingdom of God first in my life determine? What about your family? What will that determine? How I live in that family. What kind of father, mother, husband, wife I am. And certainly Jesus Christ says something about righteousness in all those relationships. But it's first, and so it's, it's singular. It's singular. I have a single focus, and so I view everything through... Kingdom glasses. 
I'm a citizen of the kingdom, and so I view everything else through kingdom glasses. As a citizen of the kingdom, this is the way Jesus teaches me to live as a husband. That's the way I want to live. Uh, as a father, worker, and so on. The same to be true, my attitude toward the civil government. Uh, what a mess we have in this nation right now. It's a mess, but we're to be subject to the governing authorities because the king in this kingdom says we're to be subject to the governing authorities uh, as long as they do not contradict the will of the king. If they contradict the will of the king, we must obey God rather than men, Acts 5.29. Okay? Because we're seeing everything through kingdom glasses. Okay? And so uh, the job, you know, I have, there's some jobs I can't have as a citizen of the kingdom. I converted some people that were bartenders. They did this or that job they had no business doing. But now, and now that they became a citizen of the king, they said, well, I can't have that job. But they trusted God would provide, and he did. And the kind of work ethic I have also, the king tells me about that. Uh, the friends and associations I have, seeking first the kingdom of God, uh, then bad company corrupts good morals. And I'm not going to think I'm the lone exception to that, you know. Uh, I need to be very careful about the, the friends that I choose, right? And kind of people I hang out with. Good, good friends. So, but, you know, you could just increase this many, many fold here. But I view everything through kingdom glasses because it's first, always. I'm continually keeping it first. Somebody have a comment? Anybody? Okay, the last point here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Facebook, I, I saw it, and I've seen that picture a couple of times. It got me thinking about something that happened to me back in the 90s. I was at a party late on a Saturday night, a Saturday night. I have one of the worst panic attacks I've ever had. Right. I just laughed. I don't think, I don't, nobody knew what I was. I just laughed and got my car. So I'm at chapter midnight, and I'm driving around Lexington in the middle of a panic attack. It's probably not the best time to drive. I don't know what it is where to go. I wind up, I just go over to the box house. I don't know what else to do. And in the middle of the night, and you know, Ruth gets up out of there and comes to the store and finds it, and she brings me in and we sit down and we just talk and we just listen and she just calms me down and she puts me to bed and the next morning we come in and we go to church. And sometimes you just have to, you know, be there for each other when you worry. Yeah. To bring that back to chapter six here, when I read Jesus, there's sort of an eighth thing going on here. These are seven reasons not to worry, but there's also the fact that. Jesus yeah. cares. You know, this yeah. is Jesus laying down the law. Thou shalt not worry. Yeah. You, yeah. You know, if you worry, you're going to be in trouble. You know, yeah. this is Jesus comforting his disciples and, and, and helping them not to worry. And if yeah. we're going to be disciples of Jesus and we are going to imitate him, then we do that to each other as well. We help to comfort each other and to help take their worry away and mm -hmm. let them know that he's there and that he's going to be there. Amen. I, I appreciate that. There's a lot of things to be said about that, Mike. You know, of course, we know God cares, casting all your anxiety on him. He cares for you, 1 Peter 5. But, I mean, we just studied from 1 Corinthians 12. We're a body, a family. And uh, when one suffers, all suffer. One rejoices, all rejoice. And uh, Romans 12 will say much the same thing. Prefer one another. Um, lift each other up. Coming here tonight. Coming here tonight is one way to lift each other up and to help each other. Um, that's a major uh, incentive, motivation given by the Hebrew writer, encouraging one another and all the more, encouraging, lifting each other up. But beyond these walls, of course, we need to also spend time with each other. I, I appreciate the fact that that person you knew they were approachable. I appreciate that. There's some people that say this or that, but they're not approachable. 
and you don't feel comfortable really doing it. Well, that, that's not right. We need to be approachable, all of us. And so someone would feel like coming to us on a situation like that or another and say, hey, I need some help here, you know? And it's a blessing to be that person. It's a blessing to be that person. Thank you. Anybody else? Jeffrey, that raises yeah. a good point that, you know, when, when Jesus says, don't worry, because all these things will be provided for you, I think occasionally we need to realize that we may be the means that that is provided through, that we can be an instrument of God's providence. You know, you think about James and he says, if a poor man comes into your assembly, mm -hmm. you can't just say to him, be born and fed. Yeah. You know, essentially say, don't worry about things. Go be warm and fed. You're going to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. James says, no, that, that's on you. Yeah. You, you got to do something about that if you know it. Yeah. So, you know, I think a lot of times this passage gets questioned by folks that would say, well, you know, there are people out there that don't have access to things. And so how does this apply to them? Yeah. I may be the means of access, or I may be the means of, of assisting them in access. So, you know, to this point, am I that person that people know that they can come to yeah. that that will assist with that? And then can I be a can I be a James 2? Yeah, you wonder if that poor fellow in James 2 ever came back after all of that. Uh, and hopefully people have seen and heard things in our lives that they know that we are, you know, approachable in that way. And maybe we've gone ahead and stepped up in some way, but to Adam's good point, uh, James very strongly makes the point, have a nice day. Christianity doesn't help anybody. You know, you, it doesn't put food on the table, doesn't put clothes on their back. And uh, Brian, uh, mentioned recently, he was thinking a lot about Matthew 25, in that you did it to one of these, you did it to me, right? You know, you provided clothing, that was me doing that, or you affected me. The way we treat each other, you know, affects our relationship with the Lord, and it's the Lord working through those people. You know, when did we see you, they say, Lord, uh, hungry, and naked, and in prison, and you know, um, well, inasmuch you did it to one of these least brethren of mine, you did it to me. So absolutely, you know, we are sometimes, there's a song we sing, isn't there? We are his hands and his arms. We are the, the vehicles of the Lord. It's a great, great hymn, getting that principle across. We are the instruments he often uses in that way. Yeah, good point, brother. Anyone else? Well, the last thing said here, verse 34, brethren, is, is so wise and practical. Um, of course, it's Jesus. It must be. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The Revised Standard Version says it this way. Let the day's own trouble be sufficient for the day. J.B. Phillips, he says, one day's trouble is enough for one day. So who wants to amplify the thoughts here? Anyone want to, what is our Lord teaching us here in a very practical way? One day at a time. Heard that many times, haven't we? One day at a time. That's all we have, right? What will God give you today? What we need today. We, we need to believe that. God will give us the basic, fundamental things. Strength. Give us the strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Lord expects me to do, but I can do those things through Christ who strengthens me. I believe that. 
Will the Lord give you the strength and what you need today? If and when tomorrow comes, then will he provide what you need tomorrow? Yeah, that's the promise. And so we don't know that tomorrow will come. We make our plans and James says, if the Lord wills, you know, we'll do this or that. Just make sure as we make our plans, it's, it, it's in God's hands, we, if the Lord wills. But uh, let's, let's spend our time and energy, talent, opportunities today, because that's what we have. That's really all we have is right now. And um, if and when tomorrow comes, we'll deal with tomorrow. Yeah, Eddie. Anxiety about tomorrow takes away our energy and effort. Yes, it does. It robs tomorrow or robs today of the energy and, and ability we have for today. That's right. Thinking about tomorrow. Okay. All right. Well, um, we've got some time. Let's go ahead and uh, move into the next section, if we may. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7 and verse 1. Matthew 7. If there's anything that is known by the world, it's Matthew 7, verse 1. They know this as well as they know John 3, 16. But is their understanding of Matthew 7, verse 1, correct? Jesus said, Matthew 7, verse 1, judge not, lest you be judged. And then he says, uh, or in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Verse 3, why do you look at the speck? in your brother's eye, but did not notice the log in your own eye. Well, that makes it pretty graphic, pretty, pretty vivid picture. Uh, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold, the log is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Let's, let's talk, um, first of all, about judging itself and what that means. Uh, if you would look at the sheet that was given to you, page one, the word judge is the idea to separate, to select, choose, and to determine, and so to judge. It doesn't say if it's good or bad, it's just the idea of separating determining something, evaluating something. Uh, in, in regard to our life beyond this life, it's both condemnation or reward, depending on how we lived our life. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, if you will. 2 Thessalonians 1. And uh, there, first, let's start in verse 5 in this verbal neighborhood. 2 Thessalonians 1 and 5, seeking to comfort suffering saints. He says, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment. There's the term from the same root word as Matthew 7, verse 1, by the way so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which indeed you are still suffering. After it is only just, after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. And so judgment will mean condemnation for some. But look at this, verse 7, to give relief to you who are afflicted. In verse 8, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and don't obey the gospel, in verse 9, these will pay the, penal the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. So again, judgment will mean condemnation for them. But what about verse 10? What will judgment mean for the, the faithful? It will mean we will be glorified on that day, marveling uh, at the things that are taking place. And so, yes, judgment is something all must face. It's fun and the man wants to die than the judgment, but judgments are for rewards. 
as well as punishment. Therefore, rewards as well as punishment. Um, one thing we never have the right to do is pass sentence on somebody in this regard. That's never, ever a right. But there, there are certain areas the Bible does teach assessments, evaluations must be made. Um, look at John 7, John 7. This is a long context that brings in chapter five, Jesus' healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda. Verse 23, if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man well on the Sabbath? Judge not according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. And so what Jesus is teaching us here is you're looking at what I did to this man superficially. You've rushed to judgment. And as a result of not considering the facts and the evidence and carefully weighing all the, the facts and the evidence that's before you, you've come up with a, a wrong assessment, false judging. Well, righteous judging, therefore, would be what? If they would have what? Exactly. Look at all the facts. Look at all the evidence God has already demonstrated. I, this man was healed. How do you think that happens? How, how does a man suddenly carrying his pallet, uh, who was formerly lame, you know, look at all the evidence. Could it be that you have a false narrative about the Sabbath and the idea of working? And uh, the rabbinical traditions are wrong. You know, could that be? And so the idea is, is righteous judging is carefully considering, weighing, assessing, evaluating the facts, digging. And that certainly should be true of one another before we reach some kind of conclusion. You know, not jumping to conclusion or rushing to judgment, definitely not doing that against one another. And Jesus is definitely condemning that in Matthew 7. So carefully weighing, but you see he's, he's condoning a careful evaluation and assessment here in John 7, 24. Go back to the sheet, if you will. Um, Jesus is not condemning what he's not condemning, uh, our use of discernment in regard to others. Um, what does he say in verse 6, Matthew 7 and verse 6? What does Jesus say in Matthew 7, verse 6, that sheds some light here? Okay, holy things would be, of course, God's word, his will, his purpose. Uh, who are the dogs? So, so now we're getting into lessons about animals. Who are the dogs here? So it's certainly not a contradiction when he says, don't give what's holy to dogs or cast pearls before swine. We can't have a contradiction there. Could it be it's a misinterpretation of judging in the first five verses? The dogs are people like Herod Antipas and uh, the, the Jews who just wouldn't reason. They re completely repudiated holy things, holy things. And uh, Jesus is saying, we'll get back to this, Lord willing, a little more. But he, he's saying you have to make an assessment. Who are those who fit into that category? I don't know until some kind of evaluation is made. And it should be an honest uh, evaluation that's made. 
Um, but it, it requires that in the same context, it requires that. He's not prohibiting discernment to distinguish or separate between good and bad and right and wrong. That's not being prohibited here. Um, secondly, he's not prohibiting redemptive warnings about sin and consequences of sin, such as in Galatians 5, deeds of the flesh, fruit of the spirit. He's not prohibiting the church from making a local congregation, from making judgments and disciplining sinful members. What about 1 Corinthians 5? What did they have? What was the situation going on in 1 Corinthians 5? What, what was a brother doing? Committing sexual immorality with his father's wife. Uh, it, it was a disgusting situation. And Paul says even Gentiles, many of those who don't even, who aren't in covenant relationship with the Lord wouldn't do such things. He says, I've already made a decision to hand such a one over to Satan. He says, remove this one from your midst. And, you know, judge those among you. He even tells them to do that. You can't judge outsiders, but judge those among you in this regard. And so it certainly would not uh, include matters of corrective discipline. When instructive discipline is broken down, whether it's the physical home or spiritual home, and all measures uh, seemingly exhausted, then it sometimes gets to this point where corrective discipline must be carried out. Care enough to correct them. And if you do it in the right way, see it as a vehicle, a way of turning them back to the Lord, because that's what it's supposed to be. Not saying goodbye, good riddance, but hopefully bringing them back to the Lord. And getting back to Mike's good point earlier, if the relationship is as it should be, and it is a belonging place, the local congregation is a spiritual environment God intended, conducive to growth, they'll miss it. They will miss the relationship. But if there's no relationship there, what's to come back to, right? All they remember a bunch of people bickering and fussing and complaining and, you know, gossiping about one another, what's to come back to? So it needs to be a good relationship that they can come back to and they'll miss it. They'll want to come back to that. Um, so this, it's not a matter of, of uh, prohibiting the church from making decisions in that regard. It's not suggesting that we tolerate sin. Christians are not to participate, have fellowship in, uh, in sin. It's not prohibiting making judgments in regard to a message that is taught. Uh, 14 years uh, back in Winsville, Missouri, had a radio program. I called it Prove All Things. Hold fast to that which is good. And that's what we need to do is don't drink the water till you know the source. Get a receipt for everything you believe. But don't put your faith in it until you put your finger on that passage in the context. And uh, God teaches us, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And so that takes some judging, assessing, evaluation. We, we must do that. So what Jesus is condemning, look at Luke's account. Let's, let's look at Luke chapter 6 of the same thing, Luke chapter 6. Luke's account of this adds a, this very, very important element here. In uh, verse 35, love your enemies, do good, lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful, and judge not, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn you will not be condemned, pardoned, and you will be pardoned. So Luke's account places judgment within the context of what? Yeah, that's right. And, you know, don't rush to that again. But especially uh, in verse uh, 36, be what? 
so it's within the context of mercy. So one way, I mean, mercy is manifested in a number of ways in helping, you know, forgiving one another of sin, helping one another physically. And one very important way mercy is manifested is in our judging of one another. Let's not forget that. It is an act of mercy to be careful about what we say and think about one another, right? It is an act of mercy. And um, the Bible makes it clear, going back to James, judgment will be merciless to him who shows no mercy. We need to be very careful about our assessing of one another. Make sure we have the facts and definitely stay away from gossip and such evil sins. But uh, let's, let's not be quick to judge, but be very careful about those kind of things. Okay? We have five minutes, we have five more minutes here. Okay, um, and then uh, Paul Earnhardt, uh, he's got a, I don't know if it's still in print or not, he's got a, I gave my copy to somebody, I wish I had it, a uh, really good book on the subject, Invitation to a Spiritual Revolution, but he, he said it this way, he said, our Lord's point is that people who are so much in need of God's mercy have no business being so merciless toward other people as usual, well said. And then, of course, uh, he is condemning hypocritical or self-righteous judging, people who are eager to point out the faults in others but not willing to see the faults in their own lives, like the Pharisee in Luke 18. And, uh, you know, David, David at one point, when Nathan came to him, he said, such a man deserves to die after the parable, and he, he shall repay fourfold. And what did Nathan say? David, you're the man. You have just condemned yourself. You know, what, what you said is true, but, but you are that person. You deserve to die. And David did deserve to die, by the way. He did deserve to die. But God was merciful. And he let him live. But uh, it just remember, it's reciprocal. When, when, when you're pointing that finger and you're judging somebody else, whatever manner you use on that person, this, I'm telling you, brethren, this is serious business. It's going to come back on you. That same measure will be used against you. So we need to be very, very careful about this. Yes, Eddie. When we try to hear a preacher, usually at the beginning of a Meaning on faith, it'll say something like this I will consider you my friend if you will point out anything that I've said that's wrong. Yeah. And particularly in the debate, by the end of the week, he certainly didn't mean it. Yeah. But because his attitude is such that if anybody points out anything that you know, they disagree with me, yeah. I'm going to hammer down on them. Yeah. And that's, that's mm -hmm. the very thing Jesus is talking about. You mm -hmm. don't have that kind of spirit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, know, you, you disagree with anything you hear, let me know, and I'll straighten you out. <laughs> Don't think that's what's supposed to be done there. Yes, Mike. This is an attitude that Jesus is always dealing with, dealing with the Pharisees, but you know, he condemns them for teaching the doctrine and commandments of men, and they have all these rules, but he also calls them hypocrites over and over and yeah. over, because they made up all these man-made rules, but they didn't even follow the man-made rules, Maybe not everybody else to follow. Yeah. That's exactly the kind of judgment that he's talking about. You have yeah. the rules, but you don't live by them. And yeah. he's saying, you're going to be held for that standard. You think that you can yeah. make up these standards and bind yeah. all the people. You're going to be held for that by God. I wish we could, you know, we're about out of time, but I wish we had more to develop that thought because what they had done in the synagogues in other settings is create an environment of judging one another. They really did. They created that so that everybody's always looking over the shoulder and policing everybody else in the wrong way, in the wrong way. 
And uh, to a large degree, I think Jesus is definitely condemning that. But the, the safety check is all in. Am I living by this? You know, when I condemn you, I got to wait a minute. Do mm -hmm. I live by this thing? Mm -hmm. And if I don't, I've got to either say, wait a minute, maybe that's not, maybe that's not just a bad thing after all. Yeah. Or I've got to make correction in my own life. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, so it's, he's definitely getting to that. He said, clean up your own life before you start you know, judging other people. Clean up your own life. We're going to, Lord willing, continue this discussion next week. Uh, finish here and then get into the last section. Keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And why does he say that here? And uh, verse 12 seems to be a summary of, of all these things to me. You tell me what you think. Um, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Our brother Kurt is visiting with us and uh, from Oklahoma. Glad you're here, brother. Would you mind dismissing us with a word of prayer? Sure. Thank you. Sounds very good. Father, we're so thankful for this beautiful day that you've given to us. The help that we have together around study your word. We're thankful for preserving it for us. We might know more about you, about the things of this life, where we've come from what we should do while we're here and where we're going. And the things that you would teach us that would help us to get to that final end. Please be with us as we go to this place for those who are not able to be here tonight. Watch over us, keep us healthy and safe. Help us always to live our lives to your glory and not ours. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.